Welcome to Our Highest Work, a podcast where we are gathering and sharing the best ideas for spiritually based success. My name is George Cow, and in today's episode, I'm excited to be interviewing Dr. Dean Radin. He's the chief scientist of the Institute of Noetic Sciences. Now, uh, as usual, I want to begin the episode with a quote, and the quote is from uh, Dean today, and, and the quote is simply this, the universe looks less like a big machine than a big thought. And perhaps that's something I'll ask uh, Dr. Radin later. So today we actually, before I bring Dr. Radin on, we begin in this episode a series on the topic of spirituality, which I've come to believe is probably the most important area of life that we can develop. Uh, it affects all the other areas of life. It um, gives us the perspective that we need to deal with the ups and downs of life. And it gives us purpose for how to direct our life in a way that is really best for the long term, both for ourselves and for the people around us. So uh, let me read you Dr. Radin's um, official bio, just a little bit here, uh, and then I'll bring him on. So uh, Dr. Dean Radin is the chief scientist as, at the Institute of Noetic Sciences, which the short for that is IONS, I-O-N-S. Prior to IONS, he has held appointments at Princeton University, uh, University of Edinburgh, uh, Scotland, AT&T Bell Labs, and SRI International, where he worked on a classified program investigating psychic phenomena for the U.S. government. He is the author or co-author of more than 200 scientific and popular articles, uh, a dozen book chapters, and three popular books, including the best-selling The Conscious Universe, published by HarperCollins, Entangled Minds, published by Simon & Schuster, and Supernormal, published by Random House. And these books have been translated into a dozen foreign languages. He's also appeared on dozens of documentaries, and television shows, including BBC's Horizon, PBS's Closer to Truth, and the Science Channel's Through the Wormhole with Morgan Freeman. And the reason why I want to invite Dr. Radin onto uh, this podcast is because he, I really see him as a wonderful model of bridging a spirituality with um, science, because he really has a, a very solid uh, scientific background. So. Uh, as we do this interview, I do welcome all of you who are watching this to uh, share your comments and questions. And you can do that by, uh, if you're watching the video, you can just comment below the video. Um, or if you're just listening and want to find the comments thread, it's www.ourhighestwork.com slash 36, since this is episode 36. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Radin, it's great to have you here with us. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. So um, maybe we can begin by having you share with us a bit more about the Institute of Noetic Sciences, since you are their chief scientist. Uh, one of the questions about uh, people who don't aren't familiar with ions, the work of ions, is what is what does the word noetic mean, and uh, what does the Institute of Noetic Sciences do? Well, the word noetic comes from the the root word nous, n o u s which is a Greek word that roughly, roughly translates into deep inner knowing. Uh, we might think of that as intuition or as those moments of insight where it's not rationally or analytically figured out information, but just something that you just know is true. So mm. noetic sciences then is the study of this non-rational form of knowing. In the West, we tend to think that knowing is only rational, but of course, there are many other ways of knowing. We can know things emotionally, we can know it intuitively, and so on. But there's actually very little research within conventional science to look at these other realms of knowing. So that's what our institute specializes in. It began in 1973 by the Apollo 14 astronaut Edgar Mitchell, who was the sixth man on the moon. And he decided to start an institute which used the tools of science to study these unusual forms of knowing, primarily because he had 
what he later realized was a mystical experience in space as a result of looking out of the capsule returning to Earth and seeing the Earth about the size of a basketball uh, and and realizing that uh, besides very few people have ever, ever seen that before, uh, that every everything we've ever known about ourselves, our history, everything that we can project in our future lives on that tiny little ball, mm. this little blue ball in space. And this sparked uh, a moment of uh, of unity between him and the other astronauts and all humanity. Mm. It, this wasn't a rational thing. It was a felt sense that somehow humanity lives on that little ball in this vastness of space. And that feeling uh, very quickly seemed to engulf some sort of consciousness or mind of the entire universe. Of course, that's what mystics try to describe. Usually they fail uh, because the feeling is ineffable. But he, he realized in studying the literature when he came home that this was a form of mystical experience, and he wondered as a, a scientist and as a, a Navy captain, how do, how do we begin to understand these things? So that was the origins of the Institute, and we continue today to study things like mystical experience, uh, spiritual experience, and psychic experience uh, using the tools of science to see well, what is it that we can learn about this. Mm, that's wonderful. I'm so glad that you guys are doing the work. I actually became familiar with IONS, um, I, I believe it was back in the 90s, and uh, I was, I've was i been just excited about, uh, about uh, what you guys, you're pushing the boundaries of science and uh, really um, making spirituality more uh, grounded in research. Um, so that's really great. So uh, maybe we can talk a bit about your newest book which is called Supernormal, and it combines science, yoga, psychic abilities. Now, people usually think of these three as quite different topics. So, how do you, what, how did you come to relate these three and uh, tell us about that? Okay, I think before I answer that question, I'd like to clarify that the idea, the quote of uh, the universe begins to look more like a great thought than a great machine. Mm -hmm. That actually was said by Sir James Jeans. Oh, okay. Thank you. Physicist from way back. Mm -hmm. uh, he said this in a book called The Mysterious Universe that he wrote in 1930. And the actual full quote is uh, the stream of human knowledge is heading towards a non mechanical reality. The universe begins to look more like a great thought than a great machine. Mind no longer appears to be an accidental intruder into the realm of matter. We are beginning to suspect that we ought rather to hail it as the creator and governor of this realm. So he wrote many, many nice things like that, and I, I just paraphrased it, and somehow now people think that I wrote it, but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, I, I actually found it in on the website Goodreads. Dot com and they have a they have a quotes uh, repository and uh, right <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I don't know how they, they, you know how these things somehow march by their own drum <laughs> so yeah yeah so supernormal uh, the the idea of supernormal came about as a result of uh, my having the opportunity to go to India a couple of years ago for a month and to go all around India and lecture at both uh, conventional universities and yoga universities. Mm -hmm. In India, a yoga university is uh, has the same status and same class as a conventional university. So mm -hmm. I was invited because my research, uh, from the Western perspective, psychic phenomena are usually looked at as askance because it seems like it has something to do with the occult or with magic, and it doesn't fit into any of our, our cultural expectations. Mm -hmm. Of course, in the East, both China, India, practically everywhere in the East, this is not the case, because there are traditions that go way back, and culturally these phenomena are, are not seen as spooky, strange, horrific things, but just part of the way that the world works. Mm. So I was talking about science testing certain kinds of, of uh, experiences that, that we would call psychic, 
uh, and showing that some classes of these experiences, we have very high confidence that they're real. These are things like clairvoyance and telepathy, a few other classes. So when I, I came home, I, uh, I was inspired to do much more research in yoga philosophy, of which at the time I didn't really know very much. Uh, I, I knew that within yoga that uh, these kinds of effects were not unexpected, but I didn't realize until I started looking into it in detail that, uh, that the, the whole range of what we see as psychic phenomena were described in great detail over 2,000 years ago as part of the, of the yoga literature. Mm. And in particular, the first written form of what we now think of as classical yoga was written by Patanjali uh, in his Yoga Sutras. These are four short books, or four one book with four short chapters. And within the Yoga Sutras, he devotes one of the four chapters to what he called the cities, or what is called the cities. Uh, it's S-I-D-D-H-I. And these are the special attainments or powers. Uh, it's a Sanskrit term. It's the special attainments that are the result of advanced meditative practice. And so when you go through those, there's roughly 25 that are described. And it's not only that the phenomena are described, but how to achieve them is wow. also described. So if you want to be uh, telepathic, or you want to develop the capacity of telepathy, you do a certain uh, series of exercises, and you meditate a certain way, and then you're telepathic. Mm. So it sounds easy, except that... Uh, especially from a Western perspective today, most people don't have the, the time or the discipline to be able to get into these verified mental states in order to be able to achieve these things. So I thought maybe there are many people who are practicing uh, yoga in particular uh, and meditation in the West who don't realize that the origins of these practices included the development of various psychic abilities, and that sci science has been looking at some of these and found that uh, that these 2,000-year-old documents was, wasn't spinning fairy tales. But some of that is really true. Mm. Wow. And uh, you mentioned that, of course, it takes uh, discipline and practice to develop these things. Can you give us an example of what type of practice and how... Uh, long it might take one to do such a practice to develop a type of capability? Well, the classical yoga, sometimes called Raja Yoga, uh, has, is uh, referred to as Ashtanga, which translates into the eight-fold path, or eight, eight steps along the path. Uh, the first couple of steps have to do with developing uh, moral and ethical fiber, uh, to teach you how to keep your ego in check and uh, value things like service to others and cleanliness and all that sort of stuff. Mm. Uh, and it's the very first things that you learn because one of the downsides of gaining uh, the cities, the special powers, is that it, it's very seductive because right. these are, are powers that can, that can be used for yourself for, for your own gain or for selfish reasons or more importantly over others. Mm -hmm. And so if your ego is not in check, what happens is the, the equivalent of becoming Darth Vader. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you gain the power but you go to the dark side and this is a no-no. So there's a lot of, of attention paid on how do you become a, a good human being basically. And then there's the uh, there's breathing practice. There's um, yoga practice that we think of as postural yoga, and these are both to get your body in shape so that you can sit for long periods of time in meditation. And ultimately, it's all really all about meditation. So it's about preparing your mind. So that you learn various forms of meditation. You get to the point where you can at will produce samadhi which is a mystical state, it's like the first stage of mysticism, mm. mystical state. And once you achieve samadhi, then you can uh, achieve a practice called samyama, also sometimes thought of as sanyama. And this is while in the state of samadhi, while in this mystical state, you put a small intentional spin. You, 
you you uh, create intention to do something, and it's that intention within samadhi where the cities are formed. That's that basically what creates the cities. Mm-hmm. So, if you want to to be telepathic, you go into samadhi. You uh, identify with your friend who you want to be telepathic with, and in the act of identifying, you become that person. This has to do with in mystical. In the mystical state, uh, things like separate objects, that even the concept of separate objects begins to disappear. You go fully non-dual, and the difference then between you, you and your friend, or here and there, or now and then, those kinds of dualities begin to dissolve. And so if you become your friend, uh, you, you are your friend. And at that state, it's not simply telepathy as in picking up a couple of uh, snatches of uh, thoughts or intentions, you know that person probably better than they know themselves. Wow. So that's just one example of, the, of what happens in the cities as a result of be identifying with the thing that you're interested in becoming. Mm, yeah, that's very, very interesting. So the, do the texts, um, given that the, the, there's a danger in these powers, do the texts uh, seem to suggest or uh, recommend working to get these powers, or are they more of an um, incidence that, that uh, one, one experiences, and exper- you know, sort of something that happens along the way to enlightenment? It's, it's more of the latter. Okay. That, uh, in the process of developing, you can use these abilities essentially as a yardstick to tell where you are, mm-hmm. or as a, a sign, signpost along the way of developing what you really want to achieve which is full enlightenment. Mm-hmm. So enlightenment within the yoga path is similar to other traditions where you, you begin to recognize that there's actually no difference between you and the universe, you primarily being yourself. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's almost as though when we think of ourselves, we have self with a small s, it's our ego self, but there is some kind of universal self. That's what the mystics all say. And so the process of enlightenment or realization is is knowing directly that small self and large self are actually the same thing. Mm. And once that state is achieved, uh, then you're, you're no, no longer a normal human being. You're, you've achieved a different kind of, of state. So that's, that's largely what it's about. And so along the way of, of reaching that level of enlightenment, people begin to experience various kinds of psychic abilities, and some of them are, are quite dramatic, and some of them are more subtle. Yeah, wow. And how, it, how have you seen these powers, uh, you know, how, how are they related outside of yoga uh, in terms of other spiritual paths? Well, the cities, as described in the Yoga Sutras, are essentially the same as the charisms, as okay. described in Catholicism, right. and the same as the caravets, as described in Islam. And the, the same could be said for Judaism and any other uh, traditional religion, as well as many different uh, esoteric traditions. So the exact names given for the, the different cities might differ, uh, the exact context might differ, but there's roughly 25 basic kinds of effects, and they, they're reported again and again, even by shamans. So there's not an unlimited number of these special abilities. They, uh, there's kind of a taxonomy of them. Uh, and as, as I'm describing all this, uh, it would be very easy for a Western person to, to listen to this and say, well, this, this sounds like, like comic books. You know, it sounds like superheroes in comic books. It, right. sounds, it sounds like nonsense. Well, that's exactly where the science part comes in. Because if you only listen to the stories, if you listen to what I'm saying and you heard it as a kind of a story, it might be fun, but you could expect that this is basically just fantasy. It's not a real thing. Mm -hmm. And the science is uh, directly then associated with the notion of how do we know whether some of these things that sound like mythology or like fantasy, how do we know if they're actually real? So that's, that's what my focus has been. Yeah, yeah, and uh, in the in the uh, cultures where 
people grow up with um, assuming that these are real. When they hear about them, they just think, oh, yeah, of course. But here in the West, when we, when we relegate this to fantasy, uh, <laughs> we don't tend to believe it until, until mainstream science says it's true. So tell us a bit, has there been a lot of research on, on these? Well, from the yogic perspective, no. From the Western science perspective, yes. And for the reason that you just said, that from an Eastern perspective, each Eastern culture accepts these things and doesn't actually even need to have it proven because why bother to prove something you already know exists? Right, right. Whereas in the West, we're very skeptical about these kinds of claims. And as a result, there's been much more science devoted to trying to figure out, are there, is this fantasy or is it real? So most of the research that is available has been Western research mm. on this. Okay, and tell us about one of the research uh, studies that you, ha you have found to be most compelling. Well, so this, the systematic study of these kinds of phenomena started about 130 years ago mm -hmm. in, in England wow. with the formation of the Society for Psychical Research. Mm -hmm. They were initially interested in uh, spiritualism and and things like what uh, mental and physical mediums could do. Mm -hmm. And very shortly after the, that began... And I was, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. So um, for those who don't know, uh, mental mediums, am I right, are the ones who are able to communicate, supposedly, communicate uh, ideas, thoughts from the, the dead, so-called. And physical mediums, as if I'm right, are the ones who are able to actually manifest, physically manifest spiritual phenomenon in the room. For example, you know, the, the physical medium would be able to manifest a um, a spirit in in the flesh, and and maybe maybe manifest objects. Is that right? That's correct. Right. Okay. So, a large part of the of the investigations over a hundred years ago were focused on uh, on mental mediums. The mental mediums get ac accurate information or not, just regardless of where the information comes from. But is it accurate? And is it done under conditions where it wasn't fraudulent? And so uh, many people, who, many of the investigators became convinced that, yes, some mediums are legitimate. They really do get real information. Others were fraudulent, no doubt. The same is true with physical mediums. A couple of physical mediums uh, withstood the, the most rigorous tests, and no one has ever found uh, any reason to suspect that it was fraud. Whereas many physical mediums, even to today, physical mediums, are clearly fraudulent. So they're, what they're doing is basically an entertainment. Mm -hmm. So because uh, the mediumship, uh, not so much the physical mediumship side, because there it's been very difficult to do science on, on what they do, uh, but on mental mediumship, it's actually relatively easy to do science, to test whether a medium is, is able to do what they claim. It doesn't say anything about the existence of, of independent entities, but uh, what science can do is say the information that a medium is describing is valid. It's real information and it wasn't obtained by ordinary means. So when researchers said, well then how, how do we interpret what this is? One interpretation is that the medium gets information from a departed loved one, a, a dead person. Another interpretation is that the medium is uh, using telepathy to figure out what the, the client wants to hear, or using clairvoyance to get information that even the client doesn't know, mm -hmm. which can later be verified. So that quickly changed the primary focus of research from being interested in spirits to being interested in what are humans capable of, primarily in terms of clairvoyance and telepathy. So that, that's where the, the origins of all of this research came from. Uh, as for uh, classes of experiments, I could describe uh, what a, a typical form of experiment is like. Is that, is that where you, you yeah, want to go? Yeah, that would be great. Wanna... That'd be great. And, and actually, maybe well, even before that, why do you think that um, the West is so skeptical about, uh, well, not only the psychical powers, but also the existence of the afterlife, etc. I, I um, grew up in uh, Taiwan and uh, I grew up in a culture where we had an altar um, to our ancestors in our house 
and where we just assumed, of course, you go on and reincarnate after you die. That wasn't even questioned. That was just normal, you know, knowledge. Um, and here in the West, it's you know, of course, we you know, the mainstream, everything, uh, radio and TV, everything. Everyone assumes companies, corporations, everyone assumes that you just, you know, uh, there's a co popular um, phrase, you know, YOLO, you only live once. Well, do we? <laughs> you know, or um, so. So why do you think? It's it's been it's so difficult to believe these things here in the West. Well, part of it comes from Western philosophy. Uh, you can trace back to to the Greeks and the Romans and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, once the uh, the Catholic Church uh, took over basically both uh, religious and the social uh, and uh, and every form of knowledge. It became very difficult for the fledgling scientists of the day. We think of people like Galileo, Copernicus, and so on. It's very difficult to challenge the church's authority on virtually anything. Right. And one of the ways that we got out of the bind, because otherwise we, we would still basically all be working according to 15th century uh, methods, we got out of the bind by... Uh, splitting the where the authority would lie. So moral and subjective authority and religious authority would stay with the church, and uh, the natural world would is now free and open for people to investigate. And it's people like Descartes who, who is, can be traced back as being one of a handful of people who pushed that idea and it essentially split our, uh, our natural world from our religious world. And of course, in the United States, the split is built into the structure of society that, that there should be a separation from church and state. And it has led to great advances. I mean, if, if people today are just as smart as they were in the 1500s, but we've made enormous advances by allowing people to study the natural world without interference, essentially, from religious concepts. So... The, the, the pendulum has swung somewhat in that much of the power today is uh, in, the, in science and the academic world in terms of establishing what is true about the physical world. Uh, when it comes to issues about religious concepts, which includes things like reincarnation and whether there's a soul and that kind of thing, science very strongly stiff arms that area. And the same is true, for, at least for some religions, that they, they say, well, you know, the natural world is in the hands of science, we're not going to touch that. Now, this is not true in the case of fundamentalists. Mm -hmm. The fundamentalists will, will have their own version of what they believe the physical world is like, and that's why they have their own schools and why, uh, why we have a Congress that's completely dysfunctional and mm -hmm. <laughs> many other things that yeah. are, are a problem. Uh, that, the, the reason then why the Western world is so skeptical is because it, it made an agreement, which is now incorporated in the way that we train scientists, uh, that you don't touch ideas that sound like they might be religious. Now, the, the, the irony here is that when somebody reports a psychic experience, that is literally just an experience. It mm has -hmm. nothing to do with religion. Mm -hmm. There are just as many atheists reporting psychic phenomena as there are anybody else. So... When science looks at this area, it, it, it is simply saying, well, people have strange experiences. How do we explain that? And without going into a religious context at all, simply what, what do we know about that kind of experience and how can we explain it? Uh, so that is, this is where a lot of the tension comes from in the West, that people, that scientists don't want to have to put their toe into religious concepts, uh, which they will interpret often as the same as spiritual concepts, and they just won't go there. And, and not only that, we'll, we'll teach students over many generations and have that you, you don't go there, just don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. So I see this tension very clearly because there aren't very many scientists who are studying these topics, and so I'm a bit of a lightning rod for scientists who have these experiences and yet know that they can't talk about it. So they come to me mm -hmm. and we talk about it and then they end the conversation by saying, please don't tell anyone that we, that we met. Wow. So we're living in a, in a taboo, essentially.
Yeah, yeah. And do you f do you feel that the scientific community is uh, going in the direction of opening up to this type of research? Well, yes and no. Mm -hmm. Yes, in the sense that uh, it is becoming a little bit easier to publish these kinds of experimental reports and theories in the mainstream. Uh, that that is happening slowly. But uh, in terms of uh, pushback from some segments of scientists who still strongly believe that, that these kinds of phenomena are a veiled form of religion, they push very hard. Right. So one of the ways that you see this is, for example, in Wikipedia, where virtually any article having to do with psychic phenomena or the people involved or the history or anything, it's extremely one-sided. Uh. You look at, at the references and the way that things are written, it's, they're, all of the articles are written in such a way so that if you're naive to this topic and you don't know anything about the history or the, or the science, you'd come away with a strong opinion that there's nothing to it, mm -hmm. a fantasy. Mm -hmm. So that, that's part of the pushback that we see, that some people have bought into what I would call a scientistic form of belief where they, they now view science as a kind of religion. Mm -hmm. And you you know you don't you don't mess with someone's religion, so they push very hard. Mm, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So y that makes your work uh, as uh, calling yourself a scientist. That's uh, well, <laughs> takes a lot of courage because uh, other scientists, uh, what society calls scientists, uh, will tend to dismiss your work and think of it as you know. Um, uh, unprovable and uh, not even worth it, you know, you have, right? It's, so it's, tell, tell, tell us about that experience. Well, what does it mean to be a scientist? Science is primarily a matter of method. It's a way of investigating the world. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It also involves theory, which are explanations for the way the world works. Mm -hmm. And then you have a, a balance between experiments to test the theories and so on. So I was trained as a, a scientist. I worked in conventional industry and science for many years, and I know how to play the game. Mm. You know, we, there's certain ways that you, you do things as a scientist. I'm the editor of a journal. I've written many papers and so on. What has sometimes happened, though, is that uh, people get an image of what science is supposed to be about. Mm -hmm. and, and the image as portrayed on, on television and some TV shows it's not bad. I mean, it's, it's, it's approximately correct, but it's also kind of a, a, a simplistic, an overly simplistic sense. And so there are societies of scientists who recognize that uh, it's important if you really want to understand the nature of reality from a scientific perspective that you remain open-minded even in the face of things that might seem weird or crazy. Mm. Uh, and so I, I belong to uh, a group called the Sci Society for Scientific Exploration, which was started by uh, 100 mainstream academics, all of whom agreed that in order to make significant advancements in areas like psychic phenomena and even in strange things like what is a UFO and are there actual departed spirits and those kinds of questions that people tend to be interested in, that you need scientists to have a society where they can get together and discuss these things, these kinds of ideas, using the same tools and methods that they would in a conventional area uh, without worrying about whether somebody's going to laugh at them. Mm. Because that, that does tend to happen among mainstream people. But at the same time, while they're laughing, they are also wish that they could talk about these things without anybody knowing that they're talking about it. Mm. So it's just par for the course whenever you're pushing against received wisdom that uh, there, are, there will be those who are threatened and, and they'll make fun of it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. That's, uh, it's hopeful for me that there's actually a, an organization and uh, you can do your research and be encouraged that uh, others will, will find it useful and interesting. Um, other scientists will find it useful and interesting. So back to, back to supernormal. Uh, tell us about what, um, well, maybe we can go into a little bit about the, uh, what, what is an example of a, of a study that um, uh, 
try to prove or show the existence of these powers. Okay, so let's consider telepathy. Mm -hmm. uh, telepathy is, is considered one of the elementary cities. Mm -hmm. These are easy to demonstrate by an advanced yogi. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and also reported fairly often, uh, spontaneously by people, that, that they, they know who's calling on the phone before they answer the phone, that kind of thing. Mm. So a method that has developed over the past 40 or 50 years is called the Gonsfeld Technique. Gonsfeld is a German word meaning whole field, and it was developed in the 1930s by uh, German psychologists who are interested in holistic ways of thinking about psychological factors. And it's not a sensory deprivation method, but more of a unpatterned sensory stimulation method. And it consists of, uh, you'd sit in a very comfy chair, you'd have uh, half a ping pong ball placed over each eye, uh, and, then, uh, and then attached with some tape. And then you're asked to keep your eyes open while a red light is shown on your face. Mm -hmm. If you imagine yourself in that condition, then anywhere you look with your eye, you see the same kind of pink color. And at the same time, you're wearing headphones that play white noise. And so after about 10 minutes in this condition where you're fully awake, and you're getting white noise, so you're hearing a lot of noise in your ears, and you, you're looking and you can't see anything anywhere, it starves your brain for something. You want some kind of pattern after a while. And this creates a hypnagogic state. It's the, the state that you fall into, like a dreamy state, uh, while you're falling asleep. You'll see images, you'll hear things. Right. You know, we're, we're trying to push you into a state which is very, very sensitive to mild uh, stimuli or mild um, impressions that may be coming from somewhere else. Most of it's coming from inside your head, but some of it might be coming from elsewhere. So while you're in that state for about 20 minutes, there's a person at a distance who selects a random picture out of a pool of four pictures. And they don't know what the pictures are in advance, and neither do you as the receiver in this experiment. And the, the task is that once they chose one of the pictures randomly, they attempt to mentally send it to you. So here's where the telepathy comes into play. You as the receiver are asked to speak out loud anything that happens, anything that uh, comes to mind. We, we call it mentate. You mentate anything that comes to mind. And what you say can be brought by a one-way audio uh, stream back to the sender. Mm -hmm. And the sender can use what you're saying as a way to adjust their mental sending strategy. Mm -hmm. So after 20 minutes of sending, uh, you as the receiver is taken out of the Gonsfeld state. You're now shown four pictures, one of which was the one that the sender was sending, along with three decoys, and you have to select the one picture that you that was actually being sent. Mm -hmm. So that, that by chance, you would select the correct one one in four times, 25%. Mm -hmm. And so when you do this kind of experiment many, many times, it's been done almost 5,000 times now by 20 laboratories around the world, you would expect, if there was no telepathy, that the best that anybody could do is 25%. Mm -hmm. Because there's no cues otherwise. There's no way to figure out what, what was randomly selected. So that's just by random and chance would be 25%. Randomly it would be 25%. That's why it's very important that the target image, the one that's being sent, is actually chosen at random. Mm -hmm. So there's no human bias that could come in and, and selecting the image. So now... Uh, you can look at the data and say, well, what, what do you get? Do you get 25%? The answer is no. You get 32%. That's the overall average after about 4,500 hmm. files of this type. And when you do the statistics on that, it's a gazillion to one odds against chance. Wow. It's, it's so far from, uh, from chance that it is basically zero. It's not possible that this is a chance result. Okay, so for those of us who aren't trained in the scientific method, 25% uh, random chance at 32% for what the telepathy studies are. The 7% the difference doesn't sound like a lot. I mean, we, you know, mainstream people might think, well, oh, it should, you know, if it's true, it should be like 80% or something like that. But, but tell us about why that 7% difference is significant. That's a, ver a very good point. Uh, it's true that 7% over chance doesn't sound like much. Maybe it sounds like it could just randomly fluctuate that much. Right, right. And so the reason why you do many, many repeated trials 
in, in a, a test of this type is because the more trials that you do, the closer and closer the, the actual hit rate, okay. 32% rather than 25%, the closer that hit rate, uh, the, the higher the confidence that you have that that is the actual hit rate. This mm -hmm. is one of the nice things about statistics that when you look at long-term averages, many repeated averages, you could end up with a really tiny effect, even a fraction of 1%. But mm -hmm. if you have enough data, your confidence that that fraction is real gets better and better. So after 4,500 trials, we know with extremely high confidence that that 32% is not a random fluctuation. Oh, I it's see. It is a real effect. Uh. That's, that's wonderful. Now, um, I know IONS, is, uh, Institute of Neurotic Sciences, is doing some of this research, right? Right. Yeah. Right. So we, we've done some uh, telepathy research. We do research on clairvoyance, on mediumship, oh. on mind-matter interaction, and on precognition. And mm -hmm. these are the four classes of experiments that can be done uh, using proper scientific methods. Uh, and, and so we have done it, and many of our colleagues around the world have done these kinds of experiments for, for many years now. So given all of your research and experimentation and just your, your studies and, and having spoken with so many um, spiritual leaders, uh, you know, philosophers, I'm curious if you would be willing to share with us what your worldview is regarding um, how this all fits together. So. Is, does, does consciousness survive death? Uh, what is the nature of the afterlife? I mean, I know I'm asking a huge question, but uh, <laughs> any, any comments you have on that? Well, when it comes to questions about the afterlife, I, I'm agnostic. Okay. I, I don't think we have enough information yet to make, uh, to, to make decisions with high confidence. Okay, okay. What I can say is that there's something like six or eight different classes of experiments which should suggest that there's something like survival, but they're not quite strong enough yet for us to say with high confidence. Like for telepathy, I have very high confidence that that exists. Mm. Because we can do very clean experiments under highly controlled conditions, and we, we, we know that it, from the data itself that something is going on here. When it comes to interpretation of how do we explain it, even right. telepathy, we still don't know. Right. So we can have very high confidence that something is real and not actually know how to even describe how it's real. Mm. It gets much more complicated, though, when we're studying something about the nature of consciousness itself, which is important if you actually want to answer the question about survival of consciousness. Like, it may not be possible to know if consciousness can survive if we don't know what consciousness is yet. Mm. And, and we don't. Mm. So... That's one of the, the difficulties in uh, trying to answer this question, which obviously is one of the, the, the key questions that most people ask. Uh, will, uh, will your awareness or, or sense of self persist after the body dies? Mm -hmm. We don't know. Mm. You know. We have these little bits of information from several classes that suggest at least that the brain and the mind or brain and consciousness may not be identical to each other. And that opens the door a little bit for maybe when the brain goes away, some aspect of consciousness will persist. But whether that leads to, whether something persists leads to the idea of a, an independent entity is an entirely different question. Right. That's the only reason why you feel like yourself is not only your awareness, but also your memory. Mm -hmm. So if your awareness and your memory get separated, there will be no you after your body goes away. Mm. There, will, there may be awareness, but it won't be, you won't know that you're you. Mm. You're, you're just awareness. Mm. Interesting. Okay. So, so how do you, what, what is your vision about where this research can take, well, how would, how would it benefit society? What is, what is possible uh, from this research? That's also a very good question. And it's, it's at getting to the, the reason or the question that I sometimes end my talks with, which is, so what? Right. So I, I can show that uh, telepathy, we have very high confidence that, that it, this exists, and clairvoyance and precognition and a few other things. Well, so what? 
and that, that's a question about pragmatics. And, and I'm sorry, right? pre, pre, precog, just, uh, just a, a, a quick definition. Clairvoyance is, is, how would you define that? Uh, the ability to perceive objects or events at a distance in space or time. Okay, so uh, being able to uh, see something happening elsewhere when we're not in, when we're not physically there, right? Or, or not the use something. of the ordinary senses. Okay, and then uh, precognition is uh, is the same as clairvoyance, except it's through time as opposed to across space. Oh, so being able to so-called see the future, or being able to see so see the future, but also maybe even see details of the past that you shouldn't yes. know. See the okay. future or the past. Okay. So, so given that you're you're feeling that this well, telepathy has the strongest confidence and clairvoyance and precognition is quite strong as well. So you were you were saying, I'm sorry. Right. So, and and uh, the other category is are direct interactions between mind and matter. Okay. Uh, otherwise, sometimes called psychokinesis. Right. So, why does it matter if any of this is true? Well, it matters partially because science creates a certain worldview about this is simply the world that we live in. Mm -hmm. you know, here's the physical reality, you are, you are in it. And our beliefs about the way the world is, and about the way that the universe is stuck together, it drives our behavior. So if we believe, as mm -hmm. Western science tells us, that we live in a, a random universe with no purpose, uh, where our minds and our brains are basically computers and your consciousness is a side effect of the computer and so on and that you only live once this this you can see very easily would lead to a, a sense of nihilism that there's no meaning or purpose to anything that it would Im immediately lead to greed because if you only live once you better grab everything you can get mm. it leads to a false sense of uh, of your own importance and on and on. Many, many of the problems that we see in the world today, you, you can say, are driven by the notion that we live in a meaningless universe. Mm -hmm. And that's what science tells us. I see. Well, if that is true, it's important to know. I mean, you can be a perfectly fine person without believing in anything uh, spiritual. But in, in the West, at least, it, it really does drive people to, uh, to behave in ways that we can consider to be selfish, at minimum. Mm. But if it's not true, if it turns out that there are, are ways of understanding the universe that actually puts meaning back into it and says that consciousness is not an accidental side effect, but it's actually a very important aspect of reality, that will change behavior because now it's not nihilistic anymore. It puts purpose and meaning back into, into reality. Mm. So we don't know yet enough. To, to be able to say, uh, is, is that worldview correct? I, I happen to think it is. Mm. Uh, I'm, my belief is based on what I see in the laboratory, not mm. on religious doctrine. But what essentially the, the pushing in that direction might be able to say, you know, there is some value to religion. Some, some of the religious concepts, especially ones that are driven directly from mysticism, they're very interesting. They tell us that there's, there's something about the nature of reality that science has, has overlooked. Mm -hmm. And it's overlooked because it's been forced to keep away from it. Mm -hmm. Well, what if we think about some future where some aspects of what we think of as spiritual or mystical or even religious, what if some of that is actually true? And it's not the cartoon version and the fundamentalist version that people think of as religion, but some aspect of that is true. Wouldn't it be interesting if we were able to understand that in scientific or at least rational terms, and how would that change civilization? How would it change the way that I behave? Maybe it wouldn't change it at all, but we're never going to know unless we actually did the study and the research to figure it out. So mm. that's where the so what comes in. Yeah, no, this is great. So given that our podcast, the title of it is Our Highest Work, and I purposely leave it up to the listener's interpretation of what that means. I'm curious if you would like to uh, take a try at this. Uh, how would you define that term, our highest work? or what, what, what does that mean to you? Well, to me, it means that uh, each of us should find out what our passion is. Mm -hmm. uh, because whether we live multiple lives or not, at least in this life, 
you need to find out what, what's really meaningful and important for you uh, and to then do that. Figure out a way that that becomes what you do in your life. Mm. So for many people, it will be uh, taking care of your family. Mm. Or that, that could be your passion. For mm. others, it would be some kind of a hobby or something. And for a smaller percentage, people uh, like me, I feel very fortunate in being able to do what I feel is most important. Mm. Important for me and maybe important for the world at large. That's how I spend my time. So mm. my work and my play are basically the same. Uh, I think and this is something that I remember from years ago that uh, the mythologist Joseph Campbell said that you should follow your bliss. Mm. And I, I think that's what our, our highest good is about. Mm. Follow your bliss. If you, if you don't know how or you can't figure it out, just keep working at it because that's what makes life worthwhile. That's right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Dr. Radin, I will be putting links to your uh, website, your book's website, Institute of Noetic Sciences in our episode notes page. Is there any anything else you'd like for me to share on, well, to share with the audience now about uh, how to connect with what you're doing? Well, I just mentioned that uh, the book Supernormal is one of the winners of the 2014 Silver Nautilus That's Award. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. yeah. It's very exciting. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, any any final thoughts for, for this interview? Any, any other words of, of wisdom you'd like to share with us? Uh, I never feel like I have any words of wisdom. <laughs> uh, I, I'm just following my bliss, and if something yeah. I say happens to, to work, then so be it. Yeah. Oh no, I, I'm I'm sure there's uh, this is going to inspire a lot of people. Well, um, Dean, thank you so much for being with us today. I really appreciate your uh, taking the time. I was happy to do the show. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right, folks. So uh, let's end the episode uh, as usual. I want to remind you to. Keep your thoughts positive, keep your heart open, and until next time, be well.